bullion versus Bitcoin. This is my ultimate shootout. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching Yankee Stacking. And I'm going to do the very best I can to give a fair and proper comparison between gold and silver bullion and Bitcoin. Now I'm going to be using terms like bullion and precious metals and, and, and gold and silver throughout this video. And I just want to clarify what I'm talking about is primarily gold and silver. Yes, platinum and palladium and rhodium, they can all be used as speculative investments, but I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to limit this discussion to gold and silver. Gold and silver can also be found in various physical configurations like bars or rounds and coinage. I won't be talking about the merits of each as I've already covered that in other videos. I'm also not going to talk about the myriad of altcoins and crypto exchanges and other options available out there for the crypto investor. So please don't litter the comments with, oh, but Yankee, Bitcoin sucks. Blah, blah coin is where it's at. <laughs> yes, many altcoins have some superior features compared to Bitcoin, but too many altcoins have just come and gone with tremendous regularity. Bitcoin is the de facto standard. It is what has shaped and fueled the crypto craze since it was invented in 2008 and began its ascendancy to stardom in 2009. I'm going to limit this analysis to Bitcoin. It's the gold standard of crypto, if you will. <laughs> Again, my goal today is to give a proper and fair comparison. And I'm going to really try to do that. I know I'm going to trigger some people. You know, they're going to say, you know, that's not fair or you're being biased or you're too partisan. I'm going to try not to be. And, and to help me to do that, I'm going to use what's called a SWOT analysis. SWOT. And you've probably heard of that before. If you haven't, it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I think it's a good way to, you know, frame the comparison. And I'm going to begin right now with gold and silver first. All right. So let's talk about bullion's strengths. This is arguably real money. It's been real money for literally millennia, since ancient times, even biblical times. And that, my friends, is what's known as standing the test of time. Gold and silver covers all aspects of what it means to be money. It's portable, it's fungible, divisible, useful as a means of exchange, especially when backing currency, for convenience sake, and it's a great store of value. In America, our economy was originally established on bimetallism, money based on gold and silver. It's in our constitution. And even when we used paper money for convenience sake, gold and silver used to back our currency, making it redeemable in gold and silver on demand. And even to this day, governments and central banks all around the world stockpile gold and to a lesser extent silver. They know the value of these rare metals. And speaking of rare, gold and silver are scarce resources. They are rare, but not too rare to function as money. And that's important. That's why ultra rare metals like rhodium just won't cut it. And why using zinc, cheap zinc, <laughs> has been a great way to reduce or debase the value of our coinage. Gold and silver's physical properties make them very useful in many ways. I mean, first of all, they're, they're absolutely beautiful to the eye. They're very easy to manipulate. Silver's conductivity and healing properties are incredible. It truly has intrinsic value. 
value that is self-evident by its tangible properties. I also believe that we are hardwired, if you will, as human beings throughout history to view money as something round and pleasing to the eye. That's why other configurations, like bars, can be more of a challenge to transact in. And that's also why cryptocurrencies are depicted as round coins. We see it as money. This does not suffer from counterparty risk. That is, risk that some other financial entity will fail or not live up to their agreement. And, you know, you get left holding the bag, if you will. No, you hold it, you own it. These are some of the uh, strengths of bullion. They're legendary, all right? They're not to be minimized. But bullion does have some weaknesses, and we need to be fair and talk about those. Now, I mentioned before that precious metals makes a good means of exchange, <laughs> Well, one of the weaknesses is that mm, they're bulky, <laughs> all right? Silver especially is bulky. We hear that a lot, right? It's heavy. <laughs> Ugh, you have to store it somewhere, right? You need a safe. It might get stolen. Those are all valid points. It's one of the reasons why I don't advocate for silver exclusively. All right, gold is much easier to store and protect and to move around with. I'm not Yankee silver, I'm Yankee stacking. I stack both, silver and gold. Another weakness is the need to convert precious metals back into fiat currency to easily exchange it for goods and services. I mean, that, that is the case, right? By the way, that is not exclusively a bullion weakness, but we'll talk about that later. But it is a challenge, right? The conversion of gold and silver back into cash or, or, or currency. It's a weakness that several uh, companies over the years have attempted to address uh, with various credit or debit card offerings that are backed by physical gold and stored somewhere in a vault. It's a way to try to streamline the purchasing process with bullion. But, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> we're not there yet. And I wonder if we'll ever really see it catch on. But even if it does become a thing, behind the scenes, all transactions with bullion-based debit cards are still converted first into dollars before the transaction is actually completed. You can't just, you know, Take your silver and take your gold and go somewhere and say, I want that. I'll buy it with this. I mean, you can. This does have a dollar value. It's pretty crazy to think that somebody would actually use this to buy something for $50 <laughs> or this for $1, but you could. Uh, as I showed back in 2018, buying something like coffee directly with silver <laughs> is uh, a humorous experience <laughs> at the least. It's kind of sad actually, but it's true. You can't exchange this for goods and services very easily. Another weakness, this stuff makes a lousy investment. I told you I was gonna trigger some people, right? I'm being fair here and I've preached this regularly. Physical gold and silver don't cash flow. They don't yield. Its capital appreciation is not that amazing. And in my opinion, flipping is not a reliable way to make a substantial ROI. It preserves wealth a lot better than generating it. That's why it's not an investment for me. It's insurance. Oh, and let me talk about one more weakness. Actually, it's more of a complaint, if you will. It's Yankee. <laughs> Try eating silver and gold during an SHTF situation. <laughs> it 
Guys, that's lame. It's a straw man argument. Try eating currency. Try you know, swallowing some quarters. Try eating Bitcoin. Enough said. That's why I prep with water and food first, not bullion. Okay, so that's all for the weaknesses. There really isn't a lot of them. But let's dive into bullion's opportunities. I believe that one day in my lifetime, we will see silver and gold's prices rise in a stunning fashion. Its value, as compared to the U.S. dollar or stock market, may stay the same, but the price will explode. And on a more speculative approach, this will translate into some incredible profits with silver and gold mining stocks. I believe that one day in my lifetime, silver and gold bullion will help protect me during a dollar collapse and the resulting SHTF scenario that will go along with it. I believe that one day in my lifetime, I will see silver and gold used as a direct means of exchange. After an initial shock and focus on food and water and shelter, etc., silver and gold will be used in barter. And the education on what constitutes silver coinage will rapidly occur. I think it's possible that goods and services will actually be priced in terms of gold and silver. Do you think that's crazy? <laughs> I don't think so. Now, granted, the opportunities I speak of are, are really more centered on being a prepper stacker as opposed to, say, a collector stacker or a flipper stacker. But I think the opportunities will be there for all types of stackers. So let's jump into bullion's threats. Again, there are not many threats to bullion, in my opinion. The big one is confiscation, the fear that some people have that what happened in 1933 when the president you know, signed a, an executive order saying that you had to turn in your gold for, for money will happen again. I think most of this is driven by unscrupulous precious metals dealers who try to sell ultra-high premium products to vulnerable people. It's a scare tactic, folks. I don't think it's likely for a lot of reasons, but there are three main ones. In early 20th century life, gold and silver were money. Our currency was still backed by it. Everyone had it in their pockets. We don't now. In fact, if you have some of this, you are in rarefied air among your friends and family and co-workers and neighbors. People don't, don't hold this stuff like they used to. <laughs> Logistically, there are many better ways for the federal government to steal our wealth. They can do it through inflation or taxes. They can change our 401k and IRA rules. They can move the goalposts with Social Security. They could even do bank bail-ins or confiscate our bank accounts. The list is almost endless. And frankly, taking our digital wealth is a trillion times easier than confiscating our meager gold and silver stashes. It just doesn't make sense anymore. And we countercultural stackers, we're going to fly largely under the radar. Back in 1933, gold and silver did not have the level of industrial uses it has today. There was no gold in computers before 1933. There were no silver in solar panels back then. Those things didn't even exist. In my opinion, the cost benefit is just simply not there for any sort of confiscation. And I'm convinced the threat to gold and silver are negligible. I actually don't see any other real threats to uh, physical gold and silver. I mean, maybe with, uh, you know, gold or silver ETFs. I mean, yeah, those are uh, investment instruments that don't necessarily have sufficient backing of, you know, physical precious metals. So buyer beware there. So there you have it. That is my SWAT, if you will, on bullion. Now, let's talk about crypto and specifically Bitcoin. Full disclosure, I am not an expert at Bitcoin. I don't have a Bitcoin wallet. I, 
I, I, I don't buy and sell crypto on uh, Coinbase. I don't eat, drink, sleep crypto like I'm sure many of you out there do. You know, I have read quite a bit on it. This is the latest book that I uh, read. It's really cool. I've studied cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in particular, and as a technologist with over 35 years in information technology and cybersecurity, I do know a little bit about blockchain and how the underlying, you know, technology, the distributed ledger technology works. In fact, my company is actually starting to make use of blockchain within uh, our industry and with uh, other partners and suppliers. So what I'm trying to say is I'm not some grumpy old fart who hates technological progress and constantly wax poetic about the good old days. No, I actually love change. So with that you know, you know, background, let me launch into this SWOT analysis right now, starting with Bitcoin's strengths. Bitcoin largely addresses many aspects of our growing crisis of confidence over fiat currency. I mean, it, it's no coincidence, guys, that Bitcoin emerged in the wake of the global financial crisis of 2008 and the subsequent you know, Great Recession. The strength of having a government-independent, non-centralized currency out of control of central banks is just incredibly attractive. I believe, like I said before, that we are on the verge of a collapse of the U.S. dollar in my lifetime. Bitcoin promises to be the heir apparent to cash, the, the future of money. Bitcoin is international. It knows no boundaries. It bypasses that inefficient currency conversion that we deal with and, and the forex markets required between nations. And that efficiency is of great usefulness in a growing global economy. See, imagine a single currency around the world. <laughs> wow! Its availability could literally span the globe and reach areas and people groups that never use a bank, that never use cash. And Bitcoin has a strength in its distributed nature through innumerable copies of transactions called ledgers all around the world. That distribution validates all the transactions. It establishes confidence in its core promise of being a trustworthy monetary system. It's also very secure. Now, to be fair, that security argument is kind of a less of a characteristic of Bitcoin per se and more of a, a characteristic of the underlying technological attributes of the distributed ledger, but it is a strength. Bitcoin claims to cover all the aspects of what it means to be money. It's Portable. I mean, come on, guys. It's it's highly portable, right? It's on my phone. <laughs> it's somewhat fungible, and it is divisible. I mean, it can be broken down into what is called a satoshi. And as to the other two aspects of money, uh, you know, whether it's a a good medium of exchange or a store of value, I'm going to talk about those under different SWAT categories. Okay. So that's what I have now for strengths of Bitcoin. Let's talk about its weaknesses. Well, while I respect the blockchain, you know, respect the blockchain, <laughs> it is still a rather unproven technology. It's constantly forking that whole building consensus thing. It's amazing. It's novel. But those things can actually cause turmoil and conflict with stakeholders. Bitcoin and its related exchanges are also highly unregulated. They're prone to hacking, fraud, manipulation. The risks are real. Yes, silver and gold are also prone to manipulation. They can be, you know, counterfeited. Yep, I know. But... A lot of the manipulation occurs 
in the paper markets. Anyway, back to Bitcoin. The uh, uncertainty due to a lack of regulation leads to not really knowing what the actual value of a Bitcoin really is. Yeah, I know what it is, you know, on the markets when you look at the ticker symbol BTC, you see what people's, you know, implied value is, but what is it intrinsically? What is the market price discovery for a Bitcoin? That's extremely difficult during this time in crypto to determine. Another weakness uh, is the whole mining approach to Bitcoin. I'm not going to go into this in too much depth due to time, but the whole design of using massive computer banks consuming extremely high levels of electricity makes mining just unsustainable. Yes, the Bitcoin halving construct was designing to help here, but even though that does you know, shrink the supply, it also makes mining even more unreasonable. Now, some claim that the, uh, the, the halving uh, will cause miners to essentially double the price at which they sell their Bitcoins, since you know th their costs are mostly fixed and they want to keep the same profit margins. So they'll, they'll double the price. That will drive Bitcoin prices up, they say. I disagree. I think the opposite could easily happen. I think miners could easily quit mining and sell out, causing the price to spiral down. But regardless, I believe the whole design of the intensive mining, you know, idea is is just inherently flawed. Here's another weakness in Bitcoin. Whales. About 111 high net worth individuals or groups of individuals drive the bullish narrative around Bitcoin. 111. Okay, that might have gone up slightly since the halving, but in my opinion, that is not good. I kind of call them the Bitcoin Rothschilds. <laughs> Oops, hope that didn't trigger someone. But, you know, think about it. If those 111 want to get out, or when they get out, that's going to tank Bitcoin. It's a lot of power with just a few individuals, and that's a weakness. The next weakness might seem really, really controversial. But I'm just going to say it. Bitcoin was initially lauded as a means of exchange, right? That was uh, a use case, uh, the primary use case, if you will. Uh, it was going to be a legit way to transact quickly, easily, and inexpensively. However, that's not really been achieved due to amazingly intense volatility and also the fact that transaction costs continue to go up the more transactions enter the blockchain okay so you simply cannot price goods and services effectively in terms of bitcoin now optimists might say that you know bitcoin is the replacement for cash but it currently lacks the utility for broad-based adoption Okay, I get that. But this Bitcoin volatility is a big reason why most retailers won't accept it. Even with the blockchain-based transactions that can potentially validate and, 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 and settle faster than payments on traditional banking networks, the lag in settlement times can still allow for wild variations in price. And most Bitcoin proponents if they're honest with themselves, will admit this fact, this, this, this weakness. They say that one day it will be, you know, a, a medium of exchange, but not quite yet. And please, I know this is a contentious point. Don't pepper me with, but Yankee, such and such business or some online merchant, you know, whatever. They're, they're taking Bitcoin. Yeah. Sure they are, but first they are converting it into fiat dollars to complete the transaction. Very few places are actually pricing their goods and services in Bitcoin. 
And if they are, they're taking a huge risk for what is, you know, probably just some marketing novelty. Think about it. Dell, Expedia, Microsoft, PayPal, Stripe, and a bunch of other merchants have actually dropped payment support for Bitcoin. It's just, it's just too volatile. And that whole variable transaction fees, just some of the reasons why they can't do it. Now, this is the same issue I mentioned with gold and silver, right? Bullion and Bitcoin are not really good currencies for day-to-day -day transactions. But just realize that you and I are not being paid in gold or Bitcoin for your work, right? The IRS is not taxing you, you know, in gold or Bitcoin, all right? They're taxing you in dollars. Let's all admit this, shall we? And can we also admit that there is definitely a lack of utility with the, you know, ephemeral thing known as a Bitcoin? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to belabor this point, but other than hodling it and, 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 and trading it, what can you do with it? I mean, this is a representation of a Bitcoin, but you, you, can't, you can't hold it. Right? You can't make something out of it. You, you, you can't use it in things. Whatever, you get my point, right? It's not the most important weakness, but it is a weakness, in my opinion. But Bitcoin's main weakness is that it's too new to be trusted as money. Could it be one day? Maybe, if it survives the threats. But before we get to threats, now that I've triggered like all the Bitcoin hodlers out there, Let's discuss Bitcoin's opportunities. Bitcoin may be an alternative to uh, collapsing currencies. Uh, it actually has been that uh, to some really troubled nations like Venezuela, North Korea. That's an opportunity for Bitcoin because it is a disruptive financial asset with the potential to really shake financial markets. It's also freedom. Many people claim that Bitcoin is highly resistant to censorship due to its open distributed ledger technology. Power to the people, right? You know, we are in control. No one can censor our money. What an amazing opportunity for nations, especially those under stress. In reality, the whole argument for Bitcoin has really actually subtly shifted away from being a good medium of exchange to one of money's other main characteristics, one that I've put under Bitcoin's opportunities, and that is a store of value. They call it digital gold. That is what is now seen as Bitcoin's greatest opportunity, especially with our current medical crisis and the, you know, fiscal and monetary insanity coming out of Washington and the Fed. But even that opportunity, in my opinion, really remains to be seen. There really just isn't a track record yet to prove that this is really a store of value. Okay, so how about another opportunity? And this one's a big one. You guys are going to love this one, I promise. Bitcoin can make you money, <laughs> a lot of money. Bitcoin is one of the greatest speculative assets we have ever seen. And I've seen a few over my years, <laughs> the dot-com mania, beanie baby craze, the housing bubble, even baseball cards when I was young. Yeah, <laughs> that is an amazing opportunity with Bitcoin. And frankly, it's why a lot of people are interested in it <laughs> to make money. But let's be careful here. What I absolutely can't stand is when someone with no knowledge of the use case of Bitcoin and its underlying technology, when someone completely ignores history and, 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 and indicators of asset bubbles, or when somebody just simply lacks investment experience, you know, like having, oh, I don't know, one or two recessions under their belt. When that person goes, Yankee, what are you talking about? Bitcoin is the number one asset in 2020. I'm making serious coin, Yankee. Look at the charts. You're missing out. 
that just makes me shake my head and go, really? Anything can temporarily make you rich or at least paper rich, depending on the time frame. Just because your paper assets are currently up, even big, doesn't mean you've actually realized those gains by selling. Nor does it mean someone else hasn't lost a small fortune. If you go into a casino, all right, and, and after an hour you're up uh, two grand, are you brilliant or just lucky? Is, is it going to last? Have you cashed out your chips? Or will the house ultimately beat you? All right, now maybe you're, you're, you're much more savvy with Bitcoin than Yankee. You probably are, actually. <laughs> and, you know, for me, it would probably be like, you know, playing at the roulette wheel. But for you out there, it's going to be like blackjack for you or, or, or maybe even poker. All right, you're, you're, you're skilled. You've done your homework. You know what you're doing. The opportunity to walk away rich might still be there. But I think the odds are not in your favor. I think the house is going to win. See, history is full of sure things. The list is long. And it is pockmarked with financial ruin. Yes, the speculative opportunities are stunning. But the volatility that can make you rich can make you a pauper tomorrow. So caveat emptor, buyer beware. Lest you think I'm, you know, I'm against the opportunity of a a speculative asset in general. You know, I'm age 54, okay? And maybe my time horizon is a lot shorter than yours. But even I uh, will invest a very small portion of my uh, discretionary currency in speculative assets like like gold and silver mining stocks they're risky though made less so with my emphasis on streaming and royalty companies but that's a speculative play and i've always been more of a conservative investor i know that i'm a contrarian by nature you know i even back you know during the dot-com days and, and you know i avoided a lot of dot-com stocks that my contemporaries loved <laughs> and a lot of them lost their shirts on. My wealth has been primarily built on a more traditional market approach based on company fundamentals and with real estate investments. So that really is my perspective on Bitcoin's opportunities. There are some, and they really are compelling in a lot of ways. But let's talk about Bitcoin's threats. Not going to spend much time talking about how crypto is, you know, primarily the currency of choice for illicit or illegal activities. I'm only going to mention that, you know, Bitcoin's image takes a hit uh, somewhat um, with adoption because of that. And, it, you know, in a large way, that doesn't paint Bitcoin in a good light. Maybe it's not fair, but, you know, that perception is a threat. Another threat is its potential lack of scarcity. Well, wait a minute, Yankee, hold on. Bitcoin is scarce, Yankee. I mean, come on. There can only be 21 million of them. That's right. The maximum number of Bitcoin that can be produced is capped at 21 million. And we have, I don't know what it is now, uh, 18 million Bitcoin tokens in circulation, I think, close to it around that, whatever. Um, So yeah, that sounds scarce. 21 million, that's it. But there's a catch. And I think that catch is a threat. See, there's no hard cap on the number of tokens that can be in circulation. Yes, community consensus determines that cap, but the possibility does exist that it could be increased. It could. Think about it. You know, since a, 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 a good chunk of these coins are being held for investment purposes, not to exchange, uh, but to hold on to, a very small number of wealthy individuals and traders, remember there was like 111 of them, the big whales, right? There's simply not that many coins to go around. And unless the Bitcoin token cap is raised well beyond that 21 million, 
I think it's simply too scarce to fundamentally become a means of exchange. Call it Bitcoin inflation. I think that could happen. I think it's a threat. And let me just say in passing, that doesn't exist with gold and silver. They are finite assets. The gold that's currently in the ground or that has been mined is all that will ever be on this planet. Unless, I don't know, we <laughs> we come up with some, you know, miracle form of alchemy or, or, I don't know, mine a meteor, which I don't see that ever being done cost effectively. No, this stuff is finite. Now, what about security? I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I, I have a lot of experience in cybersecurity. And while I fundamentally like the distributed ledger technology and think it is sound, I can assure you that not only do vulnerabilities abound with Bitcoin and the, uh, you know, the exchanges, but that if a group of bad actors wished to disrupt these exchanges and effectively crash Bitcoin, they could do it. Rogue states, including government agencies, could put the hammer down on Bitcoin. Don't fool yourself into believing otherwise. I mentioned a lack of overall regulation of Bitcoin and exchanges. Some bullish investors are welcoming that <laughs> as a form of validation of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies in general. Be careful what you wish for. Regulations, and I know what that looks like from my days at a bank, that could hamstring Bitcoin. And there are a bunch of other threats like counterparty risk, uh, exchange closures. But what I want to end on is what I believe to be the very biggest existential threat to Bitcoin. Frankly, all cryptocurrencies. And that is, it is a threat to the powers that be. Governments, central banks, they all see Bitcoin as a threat. Will they ban it? Will they make it illegal? Ultimately, I believe they will. I think governments, including the U.S. government, will first take the, well, if you can't beat them, join them approach. And they're going to issue their own cryptocurrency, a, a, a Fed coin, if you will. And mind you, there was legislative wording in the first stimulus bill for a federal digital wallet. It was removed at the last minute, but it is coming, maybe with the next stimulus bill. And I'm not alone in thinking that either. Check this video out. There is an inevitability of, ha of having a sovereign cryptocurrency in the future, even in the United States. So because of that inevitability, I look at Bitcoin as being a temporary holding spot, if you will. But boy, do I own gold and silver. That was Daniela DiMartino. She's a former Fed official and she knows what she's talking about. And if it comes, that's not a good thing. It won't be decentralized. It won't give us freedom, but it will be tantamount to a crypto takeover. They will need to remove cash and replace it with their own digital currency to further control us in our spending. It will be necessary so that the Fed can go negative with interest rates and to keep us from pulling our cash out of the banks. It's going to start as optional. Hey, <laughs> get your stimulus immediately in your new Fed wallet. No IRS needed. You don't need to wait for a check in the mail. Yeah. And it's going to continue more and more with restrictions. You better use that stimulus money, you know, by Friday. <laughs> You didn't, and it's gone. And then ultimately, all other crypto will be stopped. So what's my final SWAT result? Well, <laughs> may not be any surprise to you, but give me gold and silver as real money for wealth preservation. <laughs> and let me speculate with mining stocks. <laughs> In my opinion, Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme, but it is a pyramid scheme. 
Let me explain that. Ponzi schemes are where participants believe they're actually returning, they're actually, I'm sorry, earning returns from their investments. While pyramid scheme participants are aware that they're not earning returns from their investments, but rather earning money from recruiting new participants. That's the difference. With this, Bitcoin, <laughs> exiting investors are being compensated by the contributions of new investors. You get it? That's a pyramid scheme. And I don't want any part of that. Now, there's great money to potentially be made in a pyramid scheme. And if you want to speculate with Bitcoin, if you think you can get in early, then go for it. But understand what you are doing and why you are doing it. This is a wild gamble. Because right now, no one really wants to use their Bitcoins. They want to trade them. And if you're honest with yourself, you know why. It's because you want to get rich quick. And Yankee Spidey senses always, always go off uh, when I hear those words, get rich quick. So, so if, if you do want to invest in Bitcoin, be careful. My suggestion is date Bitcoin, but don't marry it. So what do you think of my SWAT comparison? I am guessing I may get more comments on this video than I have ever gotten on any video, but I welcome it. I really do. As long as you're respectful and you don't, you know, just blast me with four letter words or whatever. Tell me what you think. Make your arguments. You know, where would you come down on bullion or Bitcoin? Well, thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. And as always, I hope your day is a-okay.